Well, thank you everyone for joining us on this evening. Um, I'm very excited to have this lecture today because in four days, world leaders are about to descend on Glasgow for the 26th Congress of Parties or COP26 as you might be hearing of it. So over the following two weeks, all these countries will be negotiating both the emissions reductions needed to stay below um, two degrees of warming and the financing that's required to help us adapt to the expected changes under that two degrees of warming. So our knowledge of what to expect under two degrees of warming is set out in the IPCC report and they do reports um, every so often that set out the summary of knowledge. And this is the work of hundreds of authors. And so I'm very excited to have here tonight one of those authors, Dan Lunt. Dan's a paleoclimatologist and a modeler um, looking at climate change both in the present, but also in the past and how that informs our understanding of what we can expect to see in the future. And so without any further ado, I'm happy to turn this over to Dan and thank you for joining us this evening. Well, thanks, for, thanks very much, Alicia. It's uh, you know, a pleasure, pleasure to be here and uh, presenting, albeit, re albeit remotely, to the, at, at the JOLSOC. So thank you for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and so re really what I'm going to talk about today is cover three things. Um, firstly, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change, what it is, how it's formed, a little brief um, history really of the, of the IPCC and what its, what its mission is. And then I'm gonna highlight some of the key messages from the most recent report. So this is the report that came out in August this year, the so-called AR6 or sixth assessment report. I'll highlight some of the key messages, not necessarily related to geology, although some of them are, but just sort of to give you a broad overview of the report as a whole. And then finally, I'll get into sort of the meat of the talk really talking about past climate change and how the geological record um, has informed some of the assessments and findings from this most recent report and what that means for the future. So just to kick things off, a brief intro, like I say, to the I IPCC. So the IPCC is, is a part of the United Nations through the World Meteorological organization and is basically responsible for assessing um, a science related to climate change. And it's been around for a while. It was formed in, in 1988. And its aim is not to present the current state of climate science for scientists or even for the general public. It's actually for political leaders. Um, and it's supposed to represent the, the current state of the art, not only on the physical basis of climate change, but also the implications, the impacts of climate change and risks associated with that, as well as what we can do about it as a, as a society, as a globe, in terms of adaptation and, and mitigation. And almost every country in the world is a part of the IPCC, is a, is a member state. Um, and in particular, the report that came out earlier this year, and the one that I'll be talking about is working group one. There are three working groups that sort of link in with these three aspects of physical climate science, the implications and risks, number two, and then number three, adaptation and mitigation. I'm really going to be focusing on the first of those, what we call the physical science basis of climate change. Um, just to give you a flavour for how long this, this process takes, like I said, the, the most recent report came out a couple of months ago, um, on the 9th of August. The one before that came out in 2014. So there's been a sort of seven years of accumulated increased knowledge and understanding that goes into um, this most recent report compared to the previous one. In terms of the, the makeup of the scientists that actually write the reports, there are 200, more than 200 authors from a total of more than 60 countries over 14,000 cited references and more than 78,000 expert and government review comments. The reason I'm telling you these things is really that the fact that this is a document written by so many people shows that it is a consensus document. It's not the ideas of, oh no, the pet topics of one or two scientists. It is really a, a very much a community document across the whole swathe of disciplines within 
climate science. It's also up to date. It include the you know men, the majority of these fourteen thousand references and new references since the previous report. And one thing to point out is there's no new science that goes on in the IPCC. We basically review and assess already published work. So that's another key thing is it's not the work of just a few scientists, it's the work of the whole community. And finally, this is very much a peer review document. It's probably one of the most reviewed documents on the planet, I would imagine. And with this number of this number of review comments and, and as well as review comments from fellow climate scientists, there are also a large number of review comments from governments. And as a result, the government, the governments, the member states really have buy in to the process and to the final conclusions and and dis, and sort of discussion. There's an, an approval process that goes on as part of that. So what what I thought I'd do is really highlight some of the what I consider to be the the four key messages that have come out of this this most re, most recent report. And these are the key messages that are going to feed in to the COP climate conference um, starting in about ten days time that Alicia was talking about. And so the. And basically, I'm going to go through each of these in turn, just to give you a few examples, a little bit more detail about each of these before we go on and, and talk about the geology. Um, so just very briefly, the first one of these climate changes occurring everywhere. Second one, they're human induced. The changes we see are human induced. Thirdly, there are going to be changes to extreme events. Um, and finally, you know, if we want to meet our targets of one and a half degrees, then they're going to have to be immediate and wide ranging cuts. So the first of these, climate change is occurring everywhere. This is a figure from the report which shows the amount of warming that we've had since the early 1980s. And you can see the colours here. You've got sort of point anything dark, darker than red is more than sort of 0 0.6 degrees. C. This is a trend. So this is sort of the 0 0.6 degrees per decade. Um, and you can see this quite characteristic pattern of warming that we've got a few interesting things to note. Well, first thing you might notice is the warming is greatest in the Arctic. This is basically because we've got a number of important feedback processes, so-called positive feedback processes that amplify any warming that we might see sort of as, a, as a global average. So processes like the melting of Arctic sea ice in particular, as you get some initial warming, sea ice starts to melt, it leaves a darker surface behind, which then absorbs more sunlight. And therefore, you get further additional warming, further Arctic sea ice loss. And you get this positive feedback, this vicious circle, if you like, happening. And that's what we're seeing. That is what we have observed in the climate system. This is not just a theory. These are observations of recent change from a combination of meteorological stations in various parts of the globe, satellite data, has reconstructed this. Another thing we see is that there's more warming over land than over ocean in general, basically where people are, um, there's more warming. Um, that is because over the oceans, basically there's unlimited water to provide cooling by sort of latent heat release, by evaporation of, of those ocean waters. Over land, that is limit, that supply of water is limited. And so you basically get more warming than you do over the oceans. Um, but there is climate change everywhere over, everywhere over the planet. And as a result, everyone on this earth is affected. The second part of this message is that this warming is, you know, you, you might ask those, you know, there's many, obviously in the GeolSOC meeting, there are many geologists in the, the audience who will be thinking, well, climate change happens a lot. This is not, you know, you might, you know, from the geological record that we see, um, climate change occurring in the geological record. But the key thing here is that over sort of the timescales of importance here, this warming is unprecedented. And in fact, the current global mean temperature shown here, just about 1.1 degrees above a sort of pre-industrial uh, sort of 1850 baseline is actually warmer than we've seen in at least 100,000 years. 
So the current, just current global average temperatures, the warmest since at least the last interglacial, 125,000 years ago, the rate of warming is unprecedented in at least um, 2,000 years. Um, and again, probably longer. And this statement is the first of the statements in the report, the first one that I talked about that is actually built on the geological record. This is the classic um, hockey stick curve for these temperatures back here, be early prior to sort of mid 1850s, the vast majority of these records are coming from tree ring um, data. So already we're seeing the geological record actually having an, a really important input into one of the key messages from the IPCC report that will feed into COP. Second key point from the report is that the changes, these changes that we've seen in the last few decades are human induced. And that is now um, a scientific fact. In fact, it's not in previous reports, it has been some of the previous reports, it's had a sort of confidence statement associated with it. But now this is a scientific fact. We um, know that from a number of different lines of evidence, but one of them, one of the lines of evidence is through, well, one of the lines of evidence is just using your eyes. I mean, just look at this figure here of the last 2000 years of climate change. And this is basically when industri industrialization occurred. And look at this, um, kick up in temperature. Um, but another line of evidence comes through modeling work. So we use our very best climate models and use them to sort of retro predict the last 150 years. So we give them the changes in greenhouse gases that have occurred, the volcanic eruptions, changes in aerosol emissions, changes in strength of the sun. We put all those things into our model and it comes out with, or we put them actually into multiple different models and we come out with this brown curve here and a sort of uncertainty range from different models with this gray shading here. And we can compare that with what's happened observationally. So basically this black line here is a zoom in over the previous figure, got warming, amount of warming on the y-axis, 1850 to 2020 down here. Okay, so we can see this kick up again, we're sort of zooming in on this the most recent part of the previous figure. We then take exactly the same set of models, which are based basically on fluid dynamics, on our best understanding of the physics of cloud systems and atmospheric circulation and radiation. And we take out the human forcing component. So we force our model with only changes in the strength of the sun and volcanic eruptions. And this is what the model then predicts. Basically, you know, apart from the odd volcanic eruption occurring, very little change. And it's the difference between this observed change, which agrees very well with the model change, including all these aspects. It's the difference between that and this, you know, what the, what the world would have done if there were no humans on it effectively is this green curve. It's this difference which gives us basically a high degree of confidence that what we are seeing, what we have seen in particular in the last few decades is human induced. Um, if we just show that as a series of sort of bars, if you like, of a, a bar chart, this is the observed warming. This is how much of it is human induced. And actually that's, we can break that down into two components. One is increases in um, emissions of greenhouse gases, which is, would have given us about one and a half degrees of warming compared to the 1.1 degree-ish that we have had. But that is actually offset by some other human drivers like um, um, the effect of, one of the effects of industrialization is to emit more sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere. These act as a coolant um, and have actually offset some of our emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. Here is the magnitude of in terms of the sort of the global change over the course of the last 170 years, this is the effect of the of changes in volcanic eruptions and changes in the strength of the sun. So it is negligible compared to the human induced warming that we've seen. And here is a measure of sort of the, the variability, the random nature of this, um, the signal that you see in the sort of noise, the ups and downs, associated with these um, 
the trend that we see. Some of you might have heard of the global warming hiatus about 10 or so years ago. That was this. Some people said, our oh, climate change has stopped. It's slowing down. No, it carried on again. Unfortunately, it would have been better for the planet if the hiatus had been real. But anyway, third key point to come out of the IPCC report is changes not to just global average quantities like temperature um, and rainfall, but things that are perhaps more relevant to society, to humans, changes in heat waves, heavy rainfall and droughts. And one of the things, key things that has come out of the report is that, again, we have seen increases in, for example, heat waves shown here in various parts of the world. These hexagons are representing different parts of the planet. You can just probably just about make up sort of Eurasia here, Africa, Australasia, North and South America. Um, and we're seeing that almost in every part of the planet, we are seeing increases in hot extremes. And also these dots, the number of dots shows how confident we are that these changes in extremes are due to human activities. And we see, for example, in nor Northern Europe, that there has been an increase in these heat waves and we have high confidence that that change is due to humans. Similarly, for heavy precipitation leading to leading to flooding, potentially. We have, again, many parts of the world that have seen increases in heavy precipitation over the last um, 100 years or so. Some places where actually there's not enough literature or data to be able to really explore this in um, enough detail, but where we have data, most parts of the world are showing an increase in heavy precipitation. One another key thing that has come out of the report is that these changes will increase as temperature continues to increase and that every additional degree of war or fraction of a degree of warming leads to additional extreme impacts. And, the, and a key thing to bear in mind is that these climate impacts are often, well, in the majority of cases, are felt most acutely by the people who are the most vulnerable on our planet and in, and in our societies, the people who are least able to adapt. Um, and that is why the IPCC report had a, has quite a large section on the impact or the, the climate changes associated with one and a half degrees of warming. And the reason for that is that a few years ago at the last, or not the last COP, but um, a few COP meetings ago, we had the well-known Paris Agreement where the global consensus was to aim to keep global warming below one and a half degrees if possible, to avoid the most dangerous impacts of climate change. This is what a world would look like in terms of temperature with one and a half degrees warming. You see it's not one and a half degrees everywhere. The Arctic again will be the place most um, feeling the most of this one and a half degrees and over continents compared to over the oceans. Our proje projections for how temperature will go out under different scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions look like this. And the IPCC has looked at five different emission scenarios, so scenarios, storylines, if you like, about how much fossil fuel we will burn and how much CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions will take place. Only one of these, the most optimistic, so-called SSP 1, 1.9, keeps below one and a half degrees um, by the end of the century, by 2100. Um, and this is a scenario in which we hit basically net zero, as a global community, we hit net zero by um, about 2050. This is in terms of CO2 emissions going off into the future, you know, the least the most pessimistic one, the sort of um, high emissions, high use of fossil fuel, expansion of fossil fuel technologies. This one here will lead to warming of, you know, by the end of the century, nearly five degrees. Bear in mind the last ice age, the LGM 20,000 years ago, last year's maximum was about five degrees colder than today. This is basically the warming equivalent to an ice age under the most extreme scenarios. Let's hope we avoid that one. But some of these more optimistic scenarios, and especially this SSP 1, 1 1.9, is a world in which basically the COP in two weeks' time succeeds. And 
as a global community, we hit net zero by around about 2050. That is what we need in order to reach this target of, of if we want to reach this target of one and a half degrees, then that is um, what we need. And this is summary, this very nice table from the summary for policymakers. The key number here is that if we're going to have like a two thirds chance of avoiding one and a half degrees, we basically have left 400 gigatons of CO2 left to left to emit. Bear in mind that since industrialization, we have burned about 2,400 gigatons of CO2. So we're talking about we've already used up five sixths of our carbon usage. Put it in another context, if we carry on our current CO2 emissions, if there are not drastic cuts to CO2 emissions, then basically we have about 10 years left of emissions until it is too late. We have 10 years in which time to turn around our complete economy and infrastructure. And basically that process has to start now. It has to start next week at COP. There, you hear a lot of pledges about net, net zero by a certain date. China has pledged to be net zero. That is basically having, you know, not effectively not emitting any greenhouse gases anymore or emitting very little and balancing that off by removing some carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well. You hear a lot of these pledges. You hear China by going net zero by 2060. You hear um, people talking about the UK target, for example, by 2050. I live in Bristol. Bristol has a target to be net zero by 2030. In fact, very ambitious. But it turns out that these net zero targets are, are perhaps a little bit misleading because you can reach net zero by 2050 under many different pathways. And really, it's this one that we need to hit. If we're going to reach this target of 400 billion tons of carbon. This is the pathway we need to be taking to net zero, not this one we're basically going to overshoot our targets. So we need to start dropping emissions now. OK, so that was a bit about the summary, sort of halfway through the talk. That was a bit of a summary about the IPCC report in general. Now we're going to start talking about geology in the sixth assessment report and how geologists and the geological record inform some of these findings. And I think there are, there are, I can't remember, I've got three, I was going to say two, there are three main ways in which geology informs um, our climate science and this informed climate science in the IPCC report. One of them is that the geological record is incredible at providing context to both past, but in particular for the IPCC report, or I mean, by past, I mean sort of recent changes over the last, 100 years or so and future change. It provides a context to that. Very similar to the statement that I made at the beginning, one of these key findings, we are warmer than we have been at any point in the last 120,000 years. That is, an, uh, you know, that is an incredibly powerful statement that comes from the geological record. Secondly, there are some key metrics um, in the help inform our climate science. And one of them I'll talk about in a bit more detail is one called climate sensitivity. And past climates can tell us something um, about this key metric of climate sensitivity that is a really important number when it comes to things like defining these carbon budgets. And paleoclimates and the geological record are one of the key lines of evidence that informed our assessment of climate sensitivity. Finally, as I said, our, our projections of the future that inform policy are made using climate models. Now, the geological record provides a really important independent test of these models. How well does our climate model do at simulating the climate of the last glacial maximum, of the Eocene 50 million years ago, of the, of the mid Cretaceous 100 million years ago? how well our models produce these past some you know these past worlds that were quite different in many different ways to our modern climate 
um, is an important question and is one that the IPCC talked about. So these are the three aspects that I'm going to address. So first of all, this is a figure from the so-called technical summary of um, the IPCC report. So one of the sort of headline images, if you like, and it is basically all about geology. Um, what we're looking at here on these two graphs, and for, so first of all, sorry, what I'm going to talk about is past climates and the geological record providing context to past and future changes. And, you know, this is a lovely figure. It's got the time going along the x-axis from 60 million years ago over here, just after um, the iconic KPG and the death of the dinosaurs and the meteorite impact all the way through to the present day here and then off into the future, 200 years or so into the future to the year 2300. On the top, we've got measurements or estimates of CO2, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we've got a number of different timescales here, beware on the x-axis, we've got sort of a, we've got 60 million years to 10 million years here, 10 million years ago to 1 million years ago here, 800,000 years ago to 0 AD here, and then we've got 1850 to 2300 in this right-hand side. And like I said, at the top, we've got a geological record of CO2. So this is basically from things like boron isotopes, from um, alkanone data, from um, fossil leaf stomata, giving us a history of atmospheric CO2 over the last 60 million years. You can see levels, if we look at the x -axis, y axis, about 1,000 parts per million. So in other words, you know, one in a 1,000 molecules of atmosphere are CO2 when you're up here. Um, and then you've got this, these estimates, sort of more indirect estimates of CO2, if you like, over here. And then here we have bubbles of um, gas trapped in the Antarctic ice cores showing the last 800,000 years of CO2. Here you've got observations from places like the Mauna Loa or the South Pole um, record going up here to the present day. And then we've got projections of various different scenarios, some of which we've talked about before going off into the future about what we might do, what our future history might be under different policies, energy policies, basically. And you see, for example, that under these most extreme scenarios, we're looking by the year 2100, you're looking at a CO2 concentration similar to that of the Eocene 50 million years ago. We will basically be compressing tens of millions of years of CO2 change into just a few decades to centuries. Underneath, we've got the same thing, geological record, but now of temperature. These are actually, this is actually from a, a um, benthic oxygen isotope record. So basically um, inferring global mean temperature from the properties of fossils from the bottom of the ocean, an amazing a beautiful geological record of climate change. Then you've got similar, but from Antarctic ice core record, then observations of temperature and going off into the future. And again, we see that under the most extreme scenarios, temperature, we'll have the same temperature as it was during the Oligocene 40 million years ago. Um, under some of these more extreme scenarios. So this is a beautiful example, I think, of um, geological record providing context to recent and possible future changes in CO2 and temperature. Um, we can see that graphically here. Here's some geological data and models of the early Eocene, and here is the same. So this is 50 million years ago, and here's for what the world might be like in 2300. In the year 2100, under these more extreme scenarios, we might be looking at something similar to the Pliocene three million years ago. OK, and there are a number of statements that came out. This was a nice sort of PowerPoint slide summary that came out just after the, the report that put in context some of the numbers current, just recent. This is not the future. This is what has happened already. What we as humans have done to the planet already, CO2 concentrations are higher than they've been in at least 2 million years. Today, the CO2 concentration about 415 parts per million. You have to go back 2 million years to find a time period when it was that high. 
Sea level rise, the fastest it's been in at least 3,000 years. Arctic sea ice, less than we've had in at least 1,000 years. Glaciers retreating, unprecedented, the amount of glacier retreat unprecedented in at least 2,000 years. So again, these past climates putting into context um, future changes. How is this done in the IPCC? How does the, you know, the IPCC graphics department come up with these images? What's the underlying science behind that? Well, just for one of these, this is the CO2 concentration highest in at last 2 million years. This is the relevant section supporting that statement from the report. And you can see multiple references where scientists have um, reconstructed past CO2 um, from using various different techniques. The text doesn't present any new CO2 record. It's basically present, discussing, assessing published work, comparing these, assessing their relative merits, assessing the uncertainty with this, and then concluding there is high confidence, um, oh, sorry, although there is some uncertainty due to the non-continuous nature of marine sediment records, the last time atmospheric CO2 mixing ratio was high at present was very likely more than 2 million years ago. And that is basically building on work that has primarily been published in the last um, 10 years or so um, since um, uh, seven or you know, however long it is, I can't remember now, since the last 10 years or so, since the last um, IPCC report and coming up with that overall assessment. And it, this is, again, is a very nice figure from the report summarizing some of these contextual statements. Um, what we've got along the top here is a number of met these similar sort of, um, plus some others, metrics associated with recent change, recent observations, changes in CO2, the CO2 rate of change as well, temperature changes, glacier, northern tree line, and comparing these changes, which you can sort of see roughly by their colors, with some past changes from what these numbers were in pre-industrial era, compared to the last millennium, compared to the mid-Holocene, the last glacial transition, going all the way down to you know, geological events like the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. Um, so again, a very nice way of using the past to put recent changes into context. Um, the second thing that I'm going to talk about is how in the IPCC report, the past climates have informed our assessments of this key metric of, of climate sensitivity. And so, but before I say that, I'll sort of remind you a bit about this key metric of climate sensitivity. Just to define it, it is the, it is the, by equilibrium, I mean sort of a long time in the future. It is the global average surface temperature change that you'd get if you instantaneously doubled the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it's a sort of thought experiment type variable where you think, right, well, let's assume that CO2 constants are, CO2 levels have stayed constant, and then suddenly we're going to double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. We're going to let the system come to equilibrium with that change, and then we're going to measure the temperature of the planet and see how much it's changed, see how much it's warmed up due to the greenhouse effect. Why is this number important? Well, it is a key metric and a really high profile metric because with it, if we, ha if we have, if we're armed with that number, we can answer some really key questions such as, if we want to limit warming, <clears throat> to one and a half degrees C in the long term, as enshrined in the, in the Paris Agreement. What CO2 concentration can we have in the atmosphere? What CO2 concentration will give us that amount of warming? Because climate sensitivity basically relates CO2 and temperature. Another way around, if we think CO2, there's going to be a 1,200 parts per million by CO2 in the atmosphere, about three times as much as we've got now by the year 2100, how much warming will there be in equilibrium? That armed with this number of climate sensitivity, you could answer both of those policy relevant questions. It's also a number that's actually input into many economic models that assess what the economic impacts of climate change will be and impact models assessing things like um, the effect of climate change on um, global development and um, 
agri some agricultural models, for example, as well. Um, okay, so what do we know about this really important number? Well, it turns out we know that it's somewhere between about one and a half degrees and four and a half degrees. So if you double CO2, we think, we thought before this most recent IPCC report, that the warming could actually have been anything between one and a half and four and a half. And that estimate was actually made back in the 70s. And since then, through various different IPCC reports, it essentially hasn't changed. In the previous report in 2013, it was basically unchanged, effectively, our, our understanding of this number. Well, I think our understanding of it was hugely improved since this early report, but our estimate of it and the uncertainty on it was pretty much unchanged. Now, there are many lines of evidence that we used in the most recent IPCC report to assess what the real value of climate sensitivity actually is. And one of those key lines of evidence, and the one that I was um, involved heavily in, is using the geological record to inform it. Because if we can find a period in the past when CO2 was different to today, and when temperatures were different to today, then we can basically, we just need those two numbers to basically work out what climate sensitivity is. For example, we can turn, you know, scientists very often in this regard turn to the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, the last ice age, where we have very accurate records of how much carbon dioxide there was in the atmosphere from these amazing Antarctic ice cores with trapped bubbles of ancient air that allow us to basically go back in time and reconstruct the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We also know what temperature was like. We have a number of, we have many, many geological record sites where people have gone in ships, International Ocean Drilling Program, cruisers. They have extracted data from the ocean floor, for example, measured the properties of those sediments or the fossilized um, marine organisms that lived um, within the ocean during the last ice age, and we measure their properties and we reconstruct temperature. So we have, for example, we have this for multiple different time periods. And basically in, the, in this most recent report, we went through all the studies that we could find that had basically considered a certain number of uncertain, certain, you know, there was sort of a, a bar, if you like, of um, studies that we, we considered in terms of the quality of their, um, the science that they'd done. We collated all these findings, we looked at what climate sensitivity value each of these studies had reconstructed and their um, uncertainty associated with that. And overall, you know, assessing this previous work, assessing these recent studies, taking into account the uncertainties, the techniques they used, our overall assessment was that it was very likely that actually this, EC, by ECS here, I mean the climate sensitivity was greater than one and a half degrees C, um, that we had a sort of best estimate of about just over three degrees, and it was likely less than four and a half, and actually extremely likely from the geological record that climate sensitivity could be above eight, deg eight degrees. You know, the geological record just does not support those very high end values of climate sensitivity, nor does it support the very low end values. And basically, we put together this estimate of climate sensitivity from the geological record from paleoclimates, and we combined it with other lines of evidence to reach our combined assessment. And the key thing here is that because we have multiple independent lines of evidence, the overall combined assessment actually had a smaller uncertainty range than any of these individual assessments, but all of these, all these different lines of evidence were needed, including the geological record, for us to come up with this tight constraint on climate sensitivity. And actually, as a result, and in a large part due to the information from the geological record, we were able, for the first time since the 1970s, to say, to put tighter limits on this key metric climate sensitivity. So we now know that better than we ever have done in the past. And a large part of that is due to the geological record. And the overall assessment that we thought was likely that 
the climate sensitivity was between two and a half and four degrees C. So we're basically able to rule out the low end and the most optimistic and the most pessimistic values for this key metric. How is this then, this knowledge then used in the report? Well, in previous IPCC reports, we made predictions. In this case, this is global temperature, global average temperature under diff five different scenarios of emissions going into the future, how much warming we would have under this sort of high, extremely pessimistic scenario or this more optimistic scenario. And you can see that associated with each of these predictions, there is a range of values. And in fact, when you get to the high end, this range is really quite large. We don't know if we burn this amount of carbon, whether the warming will be two and a half degrees or whether it'll be just under the six. I think it'd be somewhere in between, but it's quite a wide range because our, the models that we use to make these predictions actually predict different things. The, the American model predicts something different from the UK model, which predicts something different from the French model, which predicts something different from the Australian model. And but what we were able to do in this most recent report was by looking to our estimates of climate sensitivity and how each of the models that made up these future projections compared with the estimate of climate sensitivity that was informed by the geological record, we were able to narrow these projections. And so, again, basically somewhat indirectly, but it was still a key part of it the geological record was able to increase our confidence. In other words, narrow the uncertainty range of our future projections of climate that feed into policy. Um, I'm just about running out of time. So I think I will skip through um, these final few slides quite quickly. This is just um, another figure from the report that's showing in a bit more detail how we directly evaluate climate models using geological data. We have, in the report, we looked at th three key time periods, the early Eocene climatic optimum 50 million years ago, the mid Pliocene about 3 million years ago, and the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago, um, and compared model predictions, so very similar models to those that are used to predict the future. We used them, or, or people in the literature previous to the actual I was assessing this in, in the report, but people had carried out models, model simulations of these past time periods. And in this figure here, we compared those model predictions with what the geological record said had happened in the past. And not only in terms of global average temperature, but also in terms of the amount of polar amplification, the amount of extra warming that we get in, in towards the polar regions under climate change, we were able to show that, again, the models were actually doing a good job of that compared to the data we have from the geological record. Um, I think in the interest of time, because we're coming up to quarter two, I'll finish there and just leave with these final um, sort of summary statements, if you like, that came out of um, the most recent report. So thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Oh, thank you so much, Dan. That was fascinating and um, I learned so much. So we've had a few questions come in. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom, please pop any questions you have in the Q&A box and we'll try and get to them. And if you're on YouTube, we are looking and monitoring those questions as well. So I'll start with one from YouTube and that's which um, paleoclimate, so interval in the past, best matches the RCP 4.5 scenario, so the middle of the road scenario? Yeah, so well, it, it, it depends partly on um, what time period you look at in the future, first of all. So when you pick a different, when you particular, pick a particular scenario, like the middle of the road 4.5 scenario, it's, you know, you will have a particular warming in the year 2100, which will actually be quite different from its warming in 2300. So in some ways, as you know, if, if you're looking at a scenario where CO2 emissions continue to increase, in some senses, as you go forward in time, as we as a society and as a globe go forward in time over the next few decades, you're sort of going further and further back in time. In the report, we were actually somewhat limited to um, 
the number of scenarios that we could look at for this particular figure. But in this case, you know, you can see that um, if you take um, perhaps 4.5, somewhere between um, 8.5, 2.6, um, by the year 2100, then you're probably looking at something, you know, I'm just eyeballing this now, but it looks like you're looking something a little bit like the mid Pliocene three million years ago. Um, in the year in the year 2100, you can imagine one that's perhaps a little bit cooler than this, but a little bit warmer than this, it's gonna look something, um, or a little bit warmer than this, sorry, is perhaps gonna look something like this. Um, so yeah, so maybe a, a Pliocene. One thing you have to be careful of is that there's, you have to be very careful when you're doing this, these sorts of comparisons because the pale, the past time, the geological record is expressing an, a state in general on the sorts of timescales that we're interested in that is in equilibrium with the forcing. So, for example, what that means, if we look at the mid Pliocene three million years ago, it was perhaps three degrees C warmer than a pre industrial baseline. And it was actually associated with a sea level rise of about 10 meters. That doesn't mean that when we hit three degrees C, we're suddenly going to get a, a sea level rise of um, 10 meters because the actual system, we're sort of ent entering what I've, you know, I've heard called in the media a Frankenstein climate because it's sort of made up of perhaps the temperatures from a particular past time period, but the sea level from a, from a different time because some of these other parts of the system take a lot longer to equilibrate. So really there is no perfect geological analog for changes in the near term because the, the warming that we're doing is more rapid than you know, anything we've seen in the past. Um, certainly in terms of the CO2 change that's driving it is more rapid than what we've seen in the past. And so I'm going to say you concentrated on the role of carbon dioxide, but what role do you other greenhouse gases like methane have in climate change? Yeah. So that's a very good. So that's a really good good question. I think we know what this. In terms of the paleo climate, there is a there's quite a good reason that we focus on CO two, and that's because there are very few, if any, proxies for any other greenhouse gases. You know, I don't know of any work that beyond the ice core record, you know, if you're going further beyond the ice core record, a bit further back than a million years or so, I don't know of any proxies that allow us to reconstruct atmospheric methane directly. There are many, there are several proxies for CO2, but for methane, N2O. Um, and so that's why in terms of these paleo analogs, we've sort of been focusing on, on CO2. But in terms of the climate crisis, these non-CO2 greenhouse gases are also very, very important. They're different. They have a, they are, they're interesting actually, because there's a fundamental difference between CO2 and some of the other non what we call non-condensing, um, sorry, CO2 is a non-condensing greenhouse gas, but between these, um, that compared to some other condensing greenhouse gas like CH, uh, like methane and, and N2O. And that is because the CO2 that we emit in the atmosphere, basically it's pretty much the first approximation stays there. It stays in the system. And so the CO2 that we emit will continue to warm the climate for thousands of years in the future. Whereas the methane that we emit will reduce, um, you know, once we stop emitting methane, that will begin to reduce in the atmosphere much more quickly. And what that means is actually cutting non-CO2 greenhouse gases can be a very, very, very short-term solution to some of the immediate problems, but in the long term, it is no solution at all because it is the CO2 that will stay in the atmosphere. And so it is the CO2 that we've got to primarily target and get that down first. And then we can, you know, my view is that, you know, then we can think about the other greenhouse gases. But the crucial thing is that we cut those CO2 emissions if we want to hit that target of one and a half degrees Great. in the long term. So we've had two questions come in on aerosols, which I'm going to condense. So one is, what is the role of black carbon in sort of ice melting and other environmental degradation? 
And along those lines, how do the pollutants and aerosols we emit affect climate? And if we stopped emitted, emitting those aerosols, would that affect climate? Yeah, so one of the thing, one of the um, slides I showed, I think, um, uh, well, here. Um, effectively, this is from um, you know the the latter part of the you know the last decade or so, the amount of warming that we've had compared to sort of pre-industrial baseline, and it's showing the main drivers. And basically these are the greenhouse gases. And this is effective, a lot of this, this cooling effect that we've had on the climate system is basically, you know, a lot of that is due to do with aerosol emissions like sulfate aerosols and their impacts on, cl on clouds as well. Um, and so actually, if we clean up that part of our pollution, we will see even more warming than we've had. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a sort of interesting um, side thing. Uh, one thing to say is that one of the big changes in the most recent IPCC report and a big one of the big advances in climate modelling really over the last decade or has been that we do now incorporate all of, you know, the, as far as I'm aware, all of the important um, sort of aerosols like black carbon, um, like sulphate aerosols. Um, like dust in the atmosphere, desert dust, for example, all of these things are included in many of the models that are used to make these future projections. And there are key parts of these, you know, there are two key things of these sort of more exotic, if you like, parts of, of the climate of the Earth system. Um, one of them is that we do emit them naturally. We do emit them as humans directly through things like, you know, not, um, through things like industrial processes, burning of coal, one of the off one of the byproducts of that is sulfate aerosol. But these things are also some of these are also produced naturally. And one of the things is that as so, for example, air, air, um, dust aerosols from deserts, as climate changes, the natural emissions of some of these aerosols will also change. Um, one of the things, well, as climate perhaps causes changes in um, vegetation cover, as um, then there will be changes in the emissions of, of atmospheric aerosols, including dust. So these things are important. They are taken account of in our future projections, and therefore they do feed into um, policy. And just as a by you know, as this is a geology, a geosoc meeting, we also think that these aerosols have changed naturally in the past as well and they are now being incorporated in some of our model predictions of past climates as well and it's thought that some of those could actually be really important. That's intriguing we'll have to talk about that later but I'm going to combine a few questions again so one is what caused the large changes in temperature and CO2 in the past before humans were emitting CO2? And then similarly, if we look at, say, the Eocene scenario compared with the worst case scenario, how might the Earth's systems react differently given the much faster rate of change we're seeing today? Yeah, so to, so to put this, so, so to answer the first part of your question, first of all, why have these two, you know, why have these two curves changed in the past? Um, well, our best understanding, you know, our current best understanding of the climate system is that basically it is the CO2 that is the driving um, cause of climate change on the time scale of um, millions of years in the past. And um, so if we focus, first of all, for example, on this gradual, you know, there are ups, obviously there are ups and downs and wiggles, but this gradual decrease that there's been since 50 million years ago, the peak of the early Eocene down through towards sort of the Pliocene and the Quaternary ultimately. Um, that gradual decrease, that slow decrease is basically the balance of two things going on here. There is emissions of um, CO2 from, vol from volcanism um, changing slowly over time as Things like um, you get seafloor spreading, for example, um, 
cha cha natural changes in the volcanic input of CO2 into the atmosphere. The other thing that controls that those changes is the amount of we um, weathering that we have, how much CO2 drawdown we have through the natural action of um, silicate weathering, for example. And these things change on very long time scales. In fact, it's interesting, you know, it's very interesting to mention that because just today I was putting the do the making the final sort of comments on um, a paper that we're writing. One of my PhD students, Nick Hayes, um, who's currently in Belgium. Um, did a really, some really nice work in his thesis where he was looking at how weathering changes through time and modeling, in fact, the impact of moving, changing plate tectonics, changing climate and precipitation on weathering. And what he's what he has shown actually is that some of this decrease that we see in CO2 in CO2 is actually due to um, increases in weathering over this time. This is not a new idea. This is something that's been around you know, since um, for several um, you know, for many years, and you know, there's work by Mo Ramo, for example, um, uh, showing that changes in um, the uplift of Tibetan Plateau and the Himalayas can affect weathering and, and therefore CO2. But so it's a balance between these two things. Once you get to more recent changes, perhaps the glacial interglacial fluctuations of CO2 that we see in the in ice cores. The ultimate driver of this change is change in the Earth's orbit. So Milankovic forcing changes in the um, how elliptical the Earth's orbit is around the Earth, changes in the amount the Earth's axis is tilted, the intensity of the seasons and how these two things interact with each other has an effect on the amount of CO2 um, in the atmosphere through things like affecting temperatures affecting the um, how much CO2 the ocean can hold compared to the ocean compared to the atmosphere affecting biological processes in the ocean affecting geochemical processes in the ocean all of things these things lead to variations natural variations in CO2 on time on these time scales of tens to hundreds of thousands of years um, so that is basically what is causing these fluctuations also indirectly causing these temperature these temperature change i mean these things are tightly coupled together these temperature and co2 changes um, there are positive feedbacks between the two of them ultimately both of them are being caused by changes in the earth's orbit once we get to this part of the curve is humans causing the co2 change and you know this this the bad thing about this figure is the the time scales are completely you know you have to be very careful about the time scales it looks like here like what we're doing here is similar to this but the time scales are orders of magnitude different um so sorry that was a long answer to the first part of the question the second part of the question was you know given that the recent changes are happening so much more quickly what does that mean for the future and i think the answer to that is we do not know we are moving into a, a state of the system that is unprecedented in the geological record in terms of the rapidity that it is occurring um so yeah we don't i don't think the geological record can give us some clues but there's no direct analog to what is happening now this rapid recent increase in co2 takes us outside the envelope of the last million years, two million years, actually, IPCC says, and its rapidity um, also. So it's very, become, you know, we're taking ourselves into uncharted territory, basically. I think that underscores the importance of this COP26 meeting and the negotiations coming up. So I guess just to finish off with one question somewhat related to that, um, how has the UK and maybe to some extent the world done compared to the emissions reductions that were meant to be happening so far, if we look back to 2015 and the Paris agreements yeah. and how well are we doing? Are we looking at just the emissions happening in the countries or are we starting to look at this sort of imported emissions, so emissions associated with the making of products that then come to the UK, yeah. so footprints of emissions. Well, let, let me 
take the globe first of all now how is the planet doing and the answer to that is we are a hundred percent failing at the moment co2 emissions are increasing not decreasing at the moment this shows just since 2000 the increase in co2 emissions up to the year 2020 here um, sorry, this we're looking at this black line here. So I think it finishes at 2018 or 2019 or something. You know, this is despite us knowing for decades about the climate crisis, and those emissions have continued to rise. And and you know, like I said, we have basically got at this current rate. Even if this flattened off now, this went off like this and just stayed flat, we would have nine years left before it was too late for one and a half degrees. Um, so the world is failing currently. We need this. We need an immediate and sudden and widespread cut in emissions. And so that is not happening globally. They are still increasing. In the UK, it is a different story. Emissions are coming down. Um, and the UK has a carbon budget in, enshrined in in. Um, well, I'm not sure to what extent it's enshrined in law, but we have targets for um, CO2 removal, CO2 budgets going on for the next few decades as put forward by the um, Climate Committee. So far, we have met those targets the last um, couple of times that a check has been done on that, but it does depend what you include and don't include in that budget. And the big change that is coming up, I believe, and needs certainly needs to come up, is that we, for example, previously they were not including, um, my understanding is that they weren't including emissions associated with air, with air travel, for example, in that budget. And we weren't, weren't including emissions associated with, you know, our consumption in other countries, consumption by this country fossil fuel usage that actually occurs in other countries but is associated with our usage of energy and of products um, and so that is something that needs to be you know we need to do a full proper accounting of all these of these carbon budgets and that's something that um, I think people will be pushing for at COP is to do proper full-scale accounting of these budgets. But I, you know, I should say that the world, the UK is actually, well, you know, I should be careful what you, what I say, but um, you know, I, I think the UK compared to many other countries is doing well, but it is still not doing enough. If we want to reach these targets of one and a half degrees globally, depending on, it all depends basically how much carbon you allow each country to burn. Um, you know, we have, like I said, we have 400 billion tons left. How do you divide that amongst different countries in a fair and equitable way? That is the sort of thing that might be being discussed at COP. Do you divide? Do you do it by head of population? Is that a fair, a fair way of dividing it up? In which case, of those 400 billion tons, you, the UK would get, you know, whatever percentage we have of global population. In, in China, India would get huge budgets in that way compared to many other countries. And what's a fair way of doing that? I don't know. That's why I'm not a policymaker. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm glad I'm not sitting in on those negotiations. But on that sobering note, I'm going to start to draw this to a close. Thank you so much, Dan. That was hugely insightful and informative. And I think we know a lot more about what's at stake as we go into COP26. So just wanna say there's a lot that geologists can do to help meet these emissions targets, to do it in a just way, to do it in a way that helps transform the economy and build it. Um, you can find out a little bit about that if you go to the Geological Society website and look for COP26. So that's jolsoc.org.uk forward slash COP26. Um, find out some resources there and we'll be doing a series of programming all during the next two weeks on um, COP26 and the various geological uh, ways that we are contributing. 
So with that, thank you again, Dan, and thank you to everyone who has joined us this evening.